Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's lecture hosted by the University of Bath Institute for Policy Research. My name is Nick Pierce. I'm the director of the uh, Institute, and I'm very pleased to welcome you this evening uh, to this lecture by Sean Berry. Sean um, is a London Assembly member, uh, a local councillor in London, and co leader of the Green Party uh, uh, in England and Wales since 2018. And um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, would have seen that the Green Party. Uh, did very well uh, at the recent um, local and national elections in, in the UK, uh, particularly in parts of, parts of um, places like Bristol, uh, as well as other parts of the country. And uh, across Europe, we see uh, over the last decade, and certainly in recent uh, years, a rise in the, in the political success of the Green Parties uh, of Europe. In Germany, uh, the Green Party, indisputably the second party now, and on many polls, the uh, leading party in Germany, bound to form an important part in the German government later this year in the elections there, uh, but also the Green Party doing well outside of Central and uh, Northern Europe, starting to do much better in Southern Europe, uh, and in places like the US, which have historically not had uh, strong Green Parties, um, Green issues have come to the fore through uh, the Democrats and uh, arguments for a Green New Deal and so on. So uh, a very important moment, if you like, in a kind of global politics of green parties and green movements and um, uh, and in particular also uh, as we discuss the future of our countries after the COVID pandemic how we build back better from the COVID pandemic and that I think will be the focus of Sean's uh, lecture th this evening I mean she's focused a lot of her policy work in London on housing the rights of renters uh, people living on estates as well as on, on green transport and human rights issues um, stood obviously for the mayor of London uh, in the recent elections and uh, came a strong third. Um, but today is going to be talking about this question of green recovery and what it means. And when we think about our post COVID world and the twin crises of climate change and uh, ecological crisis, uh, how we can address those questions as we think about economic recovery. So what would it mean? Uh, how would we measure it? How do we know we were successful? Uh, in building back better in a way that is consistent with meeting the challenges of climate change and conservation ecological crisis. So those are some of the questions that Sean will be addressing this evening. I'm just going to do a quick bit of housekeeping, um, which is to say that uh, your cameras and microphones will remain switched off. And if you've got a question, please submit it via the Q&A function. And then after Sean's given her lecture, I'll chair a Q&A session and I'll group together questions to put to Sean. So please do put them in the chat uh, and I'll take them from there. Um, the session is being recorded, um, so film and photography is taking place and subject to no technical difficulties, we'll make the session available online and as a podcast uh, in due course. So thanks again to you all for joining us this evening and I'll now um, with pleasure pass over to Sean. Sean. Hello, well it's really nice to be here. I don't I don't normally give lectures, so I'm looking forward to this being um, potentially quite interactive. Um, I'm going to speak for about 25, 30 minutes or so about some of the ideas that I want to bring to this debate and this discussion about what is a green recovery. I really want to get some good questions from you. Um, as has been introduced, I've spent the last, well, you know, 18 months because the election was delayed for a whole year, really focusing on policies for London, uh, a big city, a region of the country that is extremely urban and facing particular challenges. And I know that um, a lot of you um, living around the areas of uh, Bath and Bristol and the Southwest, which is where I'm from originally, and my accent will probably come out loads in this in this discussion, um, will um, will have different thoughts and, and different ideas. And I think that's what this is all about. Um, you'll hear some of the themes of my talk are about how we do this. And, and I think it's really important that listening and hearing other new perspectives and leaving space for, for bigger ideas is really important. So I'm definitely not going to be giving you uh, a lecture in the sense that I'm going to be telling you all about what to do. I'm definitely going to be raising questions and, and ideas and, and things that hopefully you'll be able to, to contribute more ideas to at the end. So the context of this, um, this lecture, this question about what is a green recovery is that these two words are, are coming together more and more. We, we faced an extraordinary challenge to our whole society, one that's been incredibly destructive, really disruptive, one in which things have had to change 
very, very quickly on a day to day basis for a lot of us, where a lot of people's futures have been thrown into doubt overnight and where things on the ground have, have, have had to change in, in sudden ways that have been quite sort of desperate and emergency in a sense, but also have, have potentially in some ways made life easier and better for some people. On the other hand, the, the crisis has exposed enormous gaps in our systems. It's completely failed in terms of respecting people's rights to basic material security. The idea that there was anything in policy um, to respect the right to a roof over your head, the right to um, a basic income. Um, literally, there was nothing there. We had to invent things overnight, like the everyone in policy for housing, like the, the furlough scheme, like the income support schemes for people who were self-employed or who were in precarious employment without proper contracts. None of this existed in our world. We'd left people um, really exposed to these gaps in our systems um, with no obvious ways of, of them being solved. We had to invent these things on the hoof. And I think that is a genuine problem. And I'll talk a bit later about some of the, the gaps in these basic principles of society that, that need to be fixed. Um, we've also seen the awful crisis exposing um, racial disparities in the public health outcomes. And we've seen a greater recognition, I think, of the fact that those disparities of outcome result from systemic discrimination that fall across all these different policy areas. Um, we've seen a, a resurgence in activism against racism, partly because of um, police action in the United States, but also I think a resurgence in interest in systemic racism, the, the historical racism that, that we've endured in this country that we've been responsible for in this country and nowhere did that come to a head more than in Bristol itself as well. So those things have prompted people I think really to, to, to think again, to, to, to look at how we organise things and recognise that it can change and just like I said at the very start more and more and more the words green and recovery are coming together because the last couple of years have also seen um, a real resurgence and um, spark amongst new generations of people in needing, in, in calling for immediate and emergency action on the climate and ecological crises. We're starting to see real genuine world scale and local impacts of the climate and ecological crises. They're starting to affect people's daily lives. They're starting to have um, detrimental impacts on people's health and incomes. Um, and, and again, exposing some of the gaps in, in our, our welfare systems and our, our homes. And um, we've done some work in the London Assembly looking at the overheating problems around people's homes. This flat is really hot right now because, because the sun is shining right in. Um, these kinds of problems are, are deadly to health as well. And people have really started to, I think, think differently and make those links now between environmental, social, racial and global justice as all these issues have been happening in our society. I think people realise now that recovery must not be about going just back to, to business as usual. It shouldn't be just about boosting our existing economy. Um, I think, I think, and I hope we've learned some of the lessons of how things were dealt with when we had to recover 10, 12 years ago from the financial crisis and the crash in, in, in some of the banks and financial institutions. Um, just pumping money in at the top doesn't work. People recognise that we must tackle these multiple crises together and that some of these gaps, some of these basic bits of security that, that maintain our human life need to be closed as well. I think people also have a, a, a much better understanding of resilience, um, of, of building back more resilient than before, that we didn't have resilience in our local areas, our local systems, people did panic and panic buy. Um, people in the period when we were locked down were by necessity using more of their local shops. But I think now when you're asking people about recovery plans, they're talking about making sure that, that we've got resilient local high streets, this idea of a 15 minute city um, where you've got more of the things you need um, locally is something that is, 
it, it, you know, people, I'm a green and I, you know, I'd like to talk about policy um, in, in seminars and, and in uh, discussions, but often when I'm out on the street um, or hanging about at a bus stop or, you know, the normal time, kinds of places where people will chat to you, um, they, they will bring these things up spontaneously. They are thinking about these things, just normal people going about their daily lives are thinking about, yeah, we could do with, you know, making this high street more resilient. We do have a problem with the amount of air pollution on this street. And, and if we see this carrying on the growth of the vans, that will lead to problems. I think this is incredibly healthy and we have to build upon that, that interest and, and support people in, in changing things. So that's, that's, that's where we are. We've got lots of people open to new ideas, thinking about quite a lot of the things that, that Greens have already been thinking about. Um, because they want the climate and ecological crises and the recovery to be built together. They're looking at some of the ideas we've, the Greens have had, um, and the Green movement more generally has put forwards um, in the past and thinking, how do these apply now? They're thinking about um, things to do with global development, things to do with climate change, things to do with um, social policy as well that have been thought about before. They're thinking now, how do these apply in the future? Um, certainly as a Green, I've never seen quite so many people voting for us before. Um, it's, you know, I mean, Germany, you've mentioned Germany, bit unfair. They're very far ahead of the, the Greens in the England and Wales. But we've had two polls in the last week where we've polled at 9%. And that is really genuinely a change. Um, you know, I've been in the, in the Greens for 20 years. We've never been polling that much in national opinion polls. It's a real, a really big change. Um, and I'm, that's that's really really exciting to me and I think it's to do with people looking at our ideas and thinking that they're good ones um, and then when you ask people you know about things like you know should we build what kind of economy should we we build after coronavirus um, my colleague Caroline Lucas um, in parliament along with the um, all-party parliamentary group for a Green New Deal has been running a project called Reset and, and how we can reset the economy and doing polling of people and two-thirds of people when asked say they want to build a greener, fairer economy. People are with us in, in the general population as well, not just the self-selecting group who come to, up to me at bus stops. So uh, the other thing I've never seen more interested in, and this is a policy that one of the things that made me join the Green Party 20 years ago, is a universal basic income. This idea that you have a universal floor in income that's, that's in, instead of a welfare system, you have to apply for something that's always there for everybody. Now, if we'd have had this at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis we'd have had none of those problems faced by all those people excluded from schemes like furlough and universal credit or, or, or support for their small businesses because they were they were new or they were um they were working freelance all of those things all of those gaps would have been closed and i've never ever seen so much interest in the idea of a basic income for everybody something that's been you know quite a quirky green policy for such a long time to become so mainstream so quickly is again a sign that people are really trying to change so i want to say i want to show you some diagrams now because it's not yeah like i said there's a, not a lot of this these ideas that have not been thought about for some time by other people and a lot of the things that um people come up with um in the world of sustainable development and green ideas come in circles so I've got basically some circles to show you and I think Sophie from the team is able to share my screen thank you very much um so this is one set of circles these are the sustainable development goals that come out of um international global thinking about how we can support people and these are you know things like basic health and well-being gender rights democracy these are things that that countries around the world are aiming for that represent sustainable development. This is a really good model of measuring our progress towards um, sustainability and towards social justice and global justice. And we can do this country by country. We can look at it on a global scale. You can look at it on a local scale as well. And it's an incredibly useful model. Now, the next circle I want to show you is the donor economics model. Now this comes from, um, you probably might be familiar with this, and if you're not, there's some really accessible materials and videos from Kate Rayworth, who is the economist who's put this together. Um, and you can see that the, the center of this donut, so the, do the donut where we want to be is the green circle, 
Um, this is the, the safe and just space for humanity. It's where we've got a, a, what she calls a regenerative and distributive, distributive economy. That's our sustainable donut. Inside it, if we're falling into shortfall, we are not achieving those sustainable development goals. And there's, there's the, the bits in the middle there reflect those same sustainable development goals. Do we have health? Do we have enough water? Do we have enough food, energy? Do we have equality? Do we have democracy, a political voice, peace and justice? Those are the things that we can fall short of that are the basic human rights and the, the stuff of human life. Um, then there's the, the safe and just space for humanity, which is the donut. And then there's all the ways in which we might overshoot and make ourselves unsustainable if we start to use them up too quickly or overshoot into those areas so you've got things like um the loss of a uh, loss of land that's um able to be used and sustainable you've got air pollution you've got climate climate change you've got pollution so all these ways in which we might overshoot our ecological ceiling outside of the donut this is a really useful model that she's developed some some excellent tools for using specifically at city level because she's been um, helped by a number of cities, including Amsterdam, who are definitely literally planning their recovery using this this model of measuring where they're at and thinking about how they can they can do do this, how they can close all those gaps in the shortfall and then remain within the donut. I think it's really useful for for cities in particular to do that. But you could look at this country by country and world by world if you wanted to. Um, again, a really useful model. Then in terms of applying. Some of these principles you know how we do it um something i'm very familiar with in london is uh the next slide which is the circular economy um and again another circle and we are trying to you know again there's no there's no obvious there's an obvious reason why sustainable people put things in circles but no nothing more obvious than the circular economy um and the idea of developing a more circular economy and um, focusing on these things in the middle first, so retaining, not demolishing, uh, particularly buildings. This is a um, this is a this is a building focused circular economy diagram. There are others for other parts of the economy. So the idea is you don't demolish buildings, you try and retain them, you refit them, you refurbish them, then you reclaim and reuse the materials. Um, if you're going to put new material, new components of buildings in, you, you use remanufactured things, you recycle. So there's all this kind of hierarchy built into this. These are, are models of thinking of how we can build a new economy, which are really useful. And then finally, I want to show you the healthy streets indicators. Um, these are developed um, by Transport for London in London. They're not in wide use um, across the country, but they really should be. They're a, a lovely way of, of assessing whether a street is healthy and sustainable for its for its local society um, and it's got indicators and you can literally measure how well things are doing in terms of these different indicators and what the diagram with this the um the star shape things in the middle is showing and someone can tell me what type of diagram that officially is is the before and after so before it was not scoring so well um, this is this is the street on the left, which is an archway, which is just up the road from me here. There was it was a bit just a traffic island. The pub had been marooned there, um, and they basically closed an awful lot of the the streets around there, made the one way system into two way streets, created a plaza, and put places to sit and a place for a market in and trees, as you can see. Um, and they've scored it before and after and seen a really significant improvement and the things that they're measuring in this circle are are the people from all walks of life it's really important that you've got old people and younger people able to use the streets that people are feel safe that they feel able to walk and cycle and they've got clean air that there's the shade and things to make them feel comfortable so <coughs> there you go there's another model using circles I think these are all really great. I, I genuinely think people are up for using all these different economic models, these measurements of, of how we're doing to, to change how we do a green recovery. And I'm really keen that at every level of government, we're thinking in these ways. So we can stop looking at the diagrams there. So that, that's what we're aiming for, these circles of sustainability. Um, now, I think the real question and the thing I want to, to talk about for the rest of 
mainly mainly the rest of what we're doing is how we do it and i think how how we do this is incredibly important um i am absolutely convinced that that you cannot plan from the top down the kind of recovery we are talking about it's so easy for for policymakers i think to want to put on their hard hats um even to just you know look at diagrams and maps and and make plans for everyone and and leave gaps and forget that they're trying to create a system that that respects everybody and not apply principles of democracy and having your voice heard to this we could have the most top down green recovery that wouldn't fulfill a lot of the goals that we're talking about there and i think some of the examples that i want i wanted to sort of highlight were things like transforming our high streets um trying to make sure that we get those 15 minute cities um that we have what we need within reach you can totally see how someone who had a very top-down approach might just hiring some some architects i'm nothing against architects but but giving them the entire process to do from scratch top down isn't the right thing to do but you can totally see how they might go right okay please design me a 15 minute city take the diagram go and go and take this this area and tell me what needs to be um destroyed and, and rebuilt and what these people need and 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 i've seen that too often in london a lot of the work i've done in london has been on housing and this approach has been taken to problems with um housing estates and, and areas of housing as well it's there are problems here so let's raise it to the ground and start again let's let's start from the drawing board and go and present it to people and say this is what we're going to do and and yeah they you know they're compelled by planning to do consultations and things but they're only putting one proposal in front of people these ideas haven't come from the people in the area and often these are incredibly wasteful plans that in the end do damage um i've looked at for example elephant and castle elephant and castle is a big roundabout kind of that's been you know that's been in south london between main roads again you know car dominated noisy we've got a shopping center that's been there for a long time and you know it's a shopping center that's not in the best of nick but because of that it's had cheap rents um, and a, a thriving community there has grown up of um, people largely from um, Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries. They've bought up the units in the shopping centre and they've created basically a thriving Latin quarter for London from scratch, from organically using their own um, using their own efforts. And it's a it's a really it's been a really wonderful place and a real centre for that community in London. And you know they they wanted to to improve the area. And they wanted to make it thrive more, and it's the you know the kind of thing that might come as part of planning for a green recovery. And it was it is the most top down plan ever. I mean, it really was just going to wipe out all of those businesses, massively gentrify the area, and you know they were putting in oh here is you know, new shops for, for people to use, and they 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 thought they were doing a good job, but really it, it it was incredibly top down, and it was really not the right thing to do. The the people in those. Um, shops and and doing those doing, doing the markets and things they they fought back and they fought back and they've managed to secure some new space and and you know just about to hang in there but to my mind the best way of doing that area would have been to do it completely from the bottom up to to ask people and to retain the buildings you know not knock everything down let's refurbish let's extend let's let's partly change what's going on let's 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 reimagine the area and transform it with people i just think it's absolutely important um and in a sort of smaller scale i've just been talking to people in in my local area of highgate in camden which is the area i represent um who we, we had a um shopping parade there a much smaller one that was um again top down planned um, and we really intervened in that in that um rebuilding and we absolutely insisted as a community that we needed to plan ourselves the kinds of shops that would go there that we wanted more independent shops that we wanted our 15 minute neighborhood to be retained and we needed our grocer and our butcher and, and our um the tailor and, and all of those things that, that that people wanted to retain in the area um and, and we were given the opportunity to do that we set up a forum that was 
local people and it, it was a lot of work for local people um who looked around different parts of london for, for small shops and, and shops that maybe shops that maybe had more, one or two premises already who they would like to induce to come and rent the new the new buildings and they they succeeded they they basically locally top bottom up from a survey with residents um right through the process curated a fairly decent now new shopping parade right next to Hampstead Heath which is doing very very well and it's been opened mainly during the pandemic and it's doing very very well and I think there's there's real scope there for more of those kinds of models and even shop by shop you know for people on the ground to be asked what do you want there let's do this bottom up because this is how we'll get by accident and by you know by natural design we'll get the kinds of communities we really really want and also think you know on the bigger scale we need to be transitioning whole industries we need to be stopping using fossil fuels we need to be making our airports smaller um, we need to be doing less international freight and then we need to be um, creating more businesses to replace those and not letting communities all around the country just become blighted by the need to move away from fossil fuels we need what's called a just transition and i think again that's that's not best done by the cabinet um or even you know local mps asking for um stimulus for their local areas and, and doing it on the sort of on the business deal level i think what we really want is for local communities to be thinking who are dependent on a particular industry at the moment to think about what they could have instead not just some other business to replace that business but how their their own local skills that have built up to support that industry could be transformed and transferred into new industries and what businesses they might want to attract of different sizes things that might be more resilient than relying on one business there's been some excellent work done by new economics foundation and i think the pcs union around the area around gatwick and doing exactly that looking at the people who work for the airlines in the logistics that are there dealing with the freight um, in all the support services that there are for the aviation industry um, looking at what their skills are and what new industries green ones that are green um, and ones that are just sustainable could be attracted to that area because of the the labor pool that is there the skills the the, the enthusiasm of, of the people there i in my plans for london and i tried not to talk too much about my plans for london i had two plans that were all about transition and one was for um city airports this is my manifesto which i'm desperately trying not to read all of it all of it to you it's a very large document um but one plan was for city airport which is a city an airport that is right by the city of london and it sits on a, a sort of island in the middle of one of the the big docks in the royal docks and it's a waste of space it's it really is for short haul flights it's for people who are coming from the city of london and want to sort of zip from short short haul flights to, to europe and places like that and those kinds of flights are very wasteful they, they ought to be taken most of them aren't being taken at the moment businesses are using video conferencing as we are today a lot more so you can cut down and reduce the amount of those flights and for those flights that do need to take place from from London, there's lots of capacity that's that's quite spare and and isn't really you know needed to be at City Airport that could be transferred to Heathrow. And we've got Crossrail opening, which will get you to Heathrow from the city in about thirty minutes. So there's really no need for City Airport anymore. And and my idea is to talk to the people who own it um, about closing it down as a business and transforming the area that it takes up, which is five hundred thousand square meters. It's a good chunk. Um, you could turn, you could plan that as a new sustainable quarter from scratch and it can include homes and it can include new businesses and jobs and it can support a lot more jobs on that space than, than the couple of thousand jobs there are currently at that airport, it's quite a small airport. And then at Heathrow, I think we do, you know, again, we need to be thinking about, we're not, we're not closing Heathrow, that isn't going to happen. Uh, we do need some aviation capacity, but, but less than before. And we need to be cutting down on quite so much freight um and and then if there are less flights there'll be fewer um people needed to to do the support work for those flights so we've got potentially a, a, if we do deal with climate change properly there is a potential um employment crisis right around heathrow and there's a lot of land in industrial estates all around the heathrow area in hounslow and hillingdon 
that are dedicated to logistics and other things that support the airport. Again, the people who work in those industries, if those industries are going to contract, what else could we do? And I've just mentioned that Heathrow is going to be connected to central London by Crossrail. So there's lots of different things that could be supporting central London where maybe services are being trans, you know, brought in from further afield that could be could be based more locally there. And again, scope to, to build more housing. And I want to get all the people who live around Heathrow, the people who currently work there, the unions, you know, the businesses that depend on Heathrow, um, who own the premises currently in the land. This isn't something the mayor can do top down. This has to be with the people who currently own the businesses in the land and the young people who are growing up now with such uncertain futures. Um, and there are a lot of young people in the boroughs that, that surround Heathrow. I'd love to get all of them thinking about what can we build here instead? That's that's really inspiring, that kind of bottom up um, things. And you, know, you can do that at the city level and you can do that sort of thing, at, you know, quite honestly, the village level, um, the part of a city level. And in my own borough of Camden, we've actually had Kate Rayworth come and talk to us about how we do donut economics type planning for, for, for Camden. I've been feeding in my ideas for things like things that support a circular economy, um, like um, repair and reuse businesses. I'm a little bit obsessed with that. I wrote a whole book called Mend It. Um, and talking about there, how we work with local communities to set up genuine businesses, you know, ones that are maybe social enterprises, but but are, have got enough turnover to support jobs and not be subsidised, that do secondhand, you know, refurbished secondhand goods, that do repairing, that aren't just about, so that our goals for reducing waste aren't just about recycling and then sending what's left to the incinerator. It's genuinely about reducing what I call in my manifesto, the stuff turnover of our economy. Um, and a you know a shift to, to to borrowing things instead of owning things, a shift to services versus ownership um, models that are particularly relevant, I think, in transport. And and again, you know, in London, we're quite privileged to have an awful lot of companies wanting to try out their shared transport services, whether that's e by e scooter hire, which we're talking about, which is being launched in trials today. But we've always been a hub for um, companies like car clubs and things like that. Well, let's plan an economy where the things you need occasionally are things that you rent. Let's let's do that. Um, and let's not forget the fashion industry, which has actually been thrown into the news um, by the marriage of the prime minister, where um, his uh, his new wife, uh, Carrie, borrowed her wedding dress, which is very that's a really that's actually a great thing that the fashion industry have been doing is uh, you know borrowing or renting clothes or or doing exchanges of clothes um we've got lots of young people now exchanging clothes via the the app called depop um where you can buy and sell your clothes so you're just not you're not owning them forever you're, you're exchanging them these are all parts of what is genuinely a green economy and something that could be based on a new um economy and a green recovery so it's just yeah there's just so many exciting ideas out there and to do that properly in a bottom-up way I think genuinely needs to involve everybody so that I, I had a plan for London that, that basically involved setting new primary waste reduction targets and stimulating an awful lot of this getting in there with you know Merrill planning powers um, trying to use large amounts of money to buy bits of land um, trying to make sure that we used a lot of our convening and leadership power to do things like pilot a basic income but I think all of these things can be done at every single level I think you know obviously if government got involved and really started to change this stuff that would be fantastic you know let's if we had a government that wanted to to create a, a green recovery by empowering local areas by pushing investment and the, the, the ability to stimulate new um, businesses into, into local areas, that would be absolutely amazing. Local, local authorities instead are very, very stretched for money and, and can't always afford to do all of this stuff. So I think it does require the voluntary sector, the, um, the, the, the academic sector, the people who are involved in, in coming up with ideas and also coming up for also in coming up with ways for to do it as well. Um, I think a lot of people need to be working in partnership with local authorities and not expecting them to do everything. But that's also a very green thing as well. Um, so essentially, that's that's my thesis. Um, I've got one more circle to show you, um, which is the last slide. And I'm about to finish on time, which is excellent. 
So my final slide, my final circle is is the earth. It's our it's our only home. Um, it's the place where we all depend on it surviving in terms of ecology, in terms of climate, for us to continue to thrive. But it's also a place where our lives are so interdependent, where the the things that we buy from all across the world deplete resources in different parts of the world, where where historical movements of people across the world, um, the historical dominance of countries like ours have affected and continue to affect other countries in terms of things like debt. And it's it's the only home where we all have our own neighborhoods and our own local places that we can transform as well. And I think we all need to be thinking very globally and very locally about this and about how we work together to close those gaps, to build a new economy, to, to come up with new ideas proactively for our local areas, to, to make the measurement of our economy about measuring well-being and resilience, not just about growth, and to make sure that we involve absolutely everybody in that. There's a there's a really good saying that says to change everything, we need everybody. And I think in this world that we have right now, this crisis that we've just faced and the, the lack of resources there are at all the levels that we need, we, are, we do genuinely need to draw on the talents and the ideas and support of everybody to get this done. And I think, like I said at the beginning, I think people are up for this. And I would like to hear from you now what you think of that and whether I'm just giving you too much work to do and all of those things. But thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, Sean. Um, very inspiring lecture. It's really uh, great to hear, um, you know, so many ideas and I, I want to, uh, pick some of those up if we can in the in the discussion. Um, <laughs> um, we have a few we have a few questions, but I'm going to start just with um, uh, I'm just just this kind of the moment we're in with COVID and the kind of critical juncture uh, that it poses to us. And you talked in particular about airports, city airports, um, mm. Heathrow reskilling, reemploying the populations that are currently employed in in aviation. And, and as you said, obviously, COVID has meant, you know, that the across the world, the aviation sector has been kind of, if not completely shut down, it's uh, lots and lots of routes have been shut down, there's been far less air traffic. Um, how far does a kind of moment like COVID and, then, and particularly the coming months really require us uh, just to not go back to doing things in the way that we did? I mean, how far do you think actually, you have to have uh, decision makers saying right we're not going to re you know reopen city airport or uh perhaps an, a, another case related to that silvertown tunnel highly contentious Ooh, oh, yeah. Yeah, same part of the world but how far you need national and other decision makers to say uh we're currently not doing these things we used to do them we're not going to do them again uh, uh when of course all the pressure is a countervailing one which is to restart the economy go get back on your feet get going again um i'm, I'm just interested in that kind of question and, and if and if you did think you needed some very kind of big interventions now to use this moment uh you know what what would be your priorities would it be aviation for example um uh would it be the redesign of, of cities you talked about that a lot so uh, could you give us just a sort of sense of that of how kind of how bold you are in trying to grasp this moment how and and, and what your priorities would be I mean, I'm, again, I'm going to really focus on cities, so tell me off as much as you want about that. But I think at a, at a government level, yes, I think, you know, the, the donut is a really, I just think that's such a useful model, because what's happened is, you know, we've, we've exposed quite a lot of the ways in which we fall short and we, we don't provide for people's basic needs. And so there you've got a real case for expanding things like welfare and having, having um, like a basic income but then at the at the ecological limit side of things by necessity things like aviation of you know in the short term come within the donut now we shouldn't be allowing things to to shift back outside again and the same goes for i think car travel i mean obviously car travel dropped like an absolute stone um we were all you know cities and i live on a main road and and it was unbelievably quiet it was so so weird and like i have trouble sleeping when i go to the countryside because i'm so used to the to the roar of the traffic it's it's really you know, it's, it's too quiet i can't sleep and it was quiet like in the countryside um really suddenly during during the actual lockdown for obvious and quite you know serious reasons 
Um, and now, you know, this the, the current mayor keeps talking about um, not allowing a car-led recovery and, and trying to prevent it. But all he's doing is really saying that. And, and there are some clear forces that are going to lead to what was a reducing amount of traffic in, in, in London in particular. And I think, you know, around the country as well, there, there's some, some movements, demographic movements away from car travel and in favour of public transport and wanting to do more cycling and walking, even if the, the ability wasn't always there to do that. There was, you know, Manchester is making, it's, it's got Chris Boardman doing quite good work in terms of improving cycle infrastructure long before coronavirus started. So there was good movement. There's a real danger that, that, tra that traffic, road traffic, massively increased and the the thing you've said before you know the danger that we just we don't do things like we carry on doing things like building silver town tunnel the economic case for which is very questionable right now and which will definitely increase traffic is really clear so at a national level we do need to cancel the road building program and put that money into something else that is direct investment by government billions and billions tens of billions of pounds planned to be spent on, on widening roads that that sh should not now be widened and new roads that should not now be built that ought to go into helping to, to build the 15 minute cities and the healthy streets and, and all of those things. So yeah, at the national level, I'd be massively changing course. And I think within cities, um, we have the power within London to introduce something like a, a road charging scheme, a per mile, a very fair, you know, not, not like the charge, which is pay once for a whole day. And that's a power we've not used, but that could be a really creative, way of using lots of different levers, encouraging people to travel at different times of the day. You know, let's let's dampen rush hour so there isn't the congestion. Mm. If people do need to travel by car because there's less public transport or because you know there's coronavirus risks and, and things, which is I don't know if that's as true as it was, then at least let's let's give them the incentives to travel at different times of the day. But there's none none of those smart levers are available to us because we don't have that kind of scheme. But if we did we we could raise money with it to, to invest. And so mm. that yeah, there's lots of opportunities that are being missed at the big policy level, I think, that, that really ought to be filled. Mm. I mean, the, the, the what, what question from my colleague Matt Deason, which the burden of which is, you know, goes back to this kind of an age old green debate, perhaps even, you know, the kind of Club of Rome, that, you know, you can't grow. Green recovery is a kind of oxymoron. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we've, we're exceeding the planet's carrying capacities and Instead of instead of talking about green recovery, we should be talking about fundamentally restructuring an economy to get to net zero much more quickly, um, and um, all the kind of radical action that you've talked about. I mean, that that's obviously a debate that's very familiar in in green politics, isn't it? Um, but I wonder, I wonder whether, uh, I mean, what you might what you might think about that. That um, you know, there's a version of of this which is Green New Deal. You know, get to net zero by 2050. Um, uh, take you know take what steps you can in the 2020s, which is different to the kind of extinction rebellion, radically restructure now. You know, you know we've got months and years, not decades. Yeah, um, and I, that's the danger. I think I should have said that there is a danger in thinking that everyone who says green recovery means the same thing, because. Mm. I'm saying recovery as in the recovery of society, so that we we regain, you know, well-being and resilience and all mm. of those things. And that's what I mean by that. And um, I do not mean let's get back to GDP growth that was predicted, you know, before. I think you know we have to um, not put GDP at the heart of this. It should be genuinely about security. Um, mm. I talk about that quite a lot in terms of. Um, people's lives you know it's really easy to to spot when people are secure um, have they got a net have they got enough to get by in a, in a, in a week and if the other wage is high enough is that is the living cost too high you know do you have that kind of security basic material security can you afford your homes um, and that's that's the measure and it's a measure of it's a measure that's the you know it's the human rights and the and the sustainable development goals Caroline Lucas has um, this this reset group this this green new deal group have been mm. um, a, um a petition and and um asking the chancellor to to focus on well-being in terms of the recovery because there is this real danger that it's just about just about stimulus just about getting the economy back to to, to growth mm. that will mean growth in resources and probably growth in inequality like like the last attempts to to recover from a crisis 
Um, we, we've, we've got a question from um, uh, colleague Tim Mays, which is about the sort of, if you like, the kind of politics of um, uh, of the Green Movement. And I mean, Tim's question is, can you know, can you do these things kind of beyond left and right? And um, I suppose one one another version of that, which Caroline Lucas is very involved in, is um, how far is green politics done through alliances with other parties, um, and how far is it done through um, influencing the thinking of other parties, combining with them electorally, whether it's kind of progressive alliance politics, uh, or how far is it is it about having a kind of strong green party that's kind of making the weather and stands on its own agenda and you know doesn't doesn't trust the mainstream parties, um, which you might say. Um, you can find different versions of that in green politics around Europe. Um, you know, some of it, uh, so some of it deliberately trying to infiltrate and work wherever it can with other parties. Um, uh, some of it resisting party politics entirely, much more of a social movement based orientation, and some of it much more about building up the green party's own strengths in different countries. Where, where do you sit on that kind of debate? I think, I think that's a, it's a really good question. Also, I noticed that Tim says you went to my school. Which is... <laughs> Yes, so you went to the boys' school. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that was that's a lovely building that has sadly been knocked down there, which is a shame. Um, which it, it was it was kind of falling down, but again, an example of a, a bit of a waste of embodied carbon there um, and losing my school. But yeah, no, I think I think that's a, that is a really good question. I mean, I'm I often talk about my sort of theory of change in, in politics. I, I worked as a campaigner for a long time um, as a road campaigner. Um, <laughs> A sustainable transport campaigner and there you know it was all about trying to build cross-party alliances you know you, you've got an idea um, a bit like the parliamentary group I've referred to a few times you get an idea together you build a set of MPs who are going to push it they then take it to the government um, and because they're cross-party and because they're coming through you who are working as a we're a charity um, those ideas can can gain weight in ways that are that are not to do with tribal party politics but I think in the end, um, you can get some good ideas taken up that way. But if ideas are truly challenging and are truly about changing things and do involve moving um, power and resources away from um, the, the, the backers of the big parties, then you mm. have to, you're not going to do that voluntarily. And those are the things that we've really struggled with, I think, is yeah. away from things like fossil fuels. So I do believe in taking power and I do believe that you know the, the strongest greens are the ones who are elected and who are part of decision making alliances and I think what's going on in councils is really really good at the moment because in councils you know everyone's standing on their own platforms um, there aren't many agreements going on ahead of time in terms of council elections and council elections are, are different because quite often you're electing more than one councillor in, in your ward um when we have elections in london you put three votes for three people it's first three past the post effectively and that means a lot of people out there who do want to see more than one party running things and who do want to see you know, different ideas and they, they're not completely tribal about who they vote for lots of people will split their votes and they'll put two greens and one neighbor mm. And that leads to councils that are quite diverse, where you, you you have no overall control. It's really common. And then the parties have to work together to make alliances. And now more and more Greens are getting elected. And we are part of an awful lot of um, cooperative. Uh, they're all called different things. Some of them are called cooperative councils. Some of them are called alliances um, across the country. And, and they do have, often they have independence in as well. And they, and they do have, I think, more strength for that um, because there isn't just one group acting in a top-down way. And I think Greens are, we have a, a quite, within our party, we don't have a lot of top-down structures as well. So we're quite used to doing that and we're quite able to cope and, and hold these kinds of things together. So I think that's, there's a genuine place for, for the Greens in, in that kind of bridging the gap at least in in our attitudes to how to get things done if not on the left right spectrum because we're pretty left but we we are able to 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 stomach talking to everybody and able to to i think bring people together in in things that are that are stronger for being cross party and i think possibly part of my background in that is is why i'm drawn to the greens rather than any other like more tribal mm -hmm. party i never work with that you know?
Yeah, yeah, and, and certainly the German. That's the the German Greens have done exactly that, haven't they? They've they've uh, formed coalitions with different parties at different levels of German government. And... Yeah, I mean they a PR system, a system of yeah, almost set up to achieve that. I think that's a much healthier part thing of politics. But in yeah. England and Wales, and it, it really only happens at the council level that you mm. get that kind of diversity. In Scotland and Wales, we have PR as well. Yeah, as well. they've got more diverse government. Mm. There's a couple of questions, Sean. Which um, the first one and the and the and a fourth one from uh, my colleague Aurelie Charles, which is um, uh, about sort of the question of sort of financing community development and thinking about promoting community development. I mean, you, you stress that a lot in your talk. Um, and then the related question then of the kind of what what is the the relationship between the kind of bottom up and the top down and the kind of so something like basic income, for example. Um, and we do a lot of work on the basic income at, at the IPR. Uh, a lot of the pressure for basic income is coming from the grassroots. It's coming from people that can see some of the dysfunctions of the welfare state at the kind of local uh, grassroots level, um, wanting to push forward with pilots, you know, that's particularly the case, as you know, in Scotland. Um, and yet most of the powers and resources you need over the tax and benefit system, particularly in a, a state like the UK, are held at the level of national government you know you just can't do a basic income uh, at a local authority level in in you know it, in a way that really is a basic income i mean you can give grants out but it's not going to be uh, a basic income so i wonder what you think about that kind of challenge of how far you invest in the bottom up and how far you try to uh, and need to uh, uh, do the kind of top down or the uh, using the full panoply of state power yeah it's it's, it's a really tricky one this because Yes, a universal basic income would be, I think, truly transformative. But persuading a government that doesn't really like the idea to, to do that is almost impossible because it does require such a... The idea is that the, the basic income replaces most of the welfare system. Um, and there's huge amounts of scepticism about this. Often when people talk about the cost, they just add up. They just go, well, so you're going to give £10,000 a year to every person. Well, that's... And they just multiply it by the population and then go, how are you going to get that money? And actually, you know, there's there's a lot of there's an awful lot of waste in our welfare system at the moment. The amount of all the money that we give to um those companies that do the um the the assessments of people to see every six months to see if they're still disabled and, and all of that money is completely not necessary um all of the the means tested benefits all of the paperwork that goes into that all of the harm that gets done to people when they end up you know waiting five weeks and they're a family without food you know those children are scarred for life by experiences like that people don't realize the, the impact that this has and this is all money that then sort of leaks out of the economy later so this is a really good idea but persuading the government that that is true like on spec is really difficult so there's there's a great um, there's a there's a campaign essentially um and a set of a network of campaigners called the ubi labs network and they're very deliberately called ubi labs because they want to do experiments and what they've got is more than 500 people like me who are elected at a local and regional level signed up to say we want to see pilots of basic income in our area and pilots of basic income don't are there to show some of the benefits to demonstrate no. some of what we think will happen so that could be people taking more time to do caring work and therefore saving um you know increasing well-being um reducing worry and, and also saving money on on potentially you know care yeah. Services. It could be people being educating themselves and therefore improving their prospects. It could be people just just not getting into problems with their their mental health, or it could just be really material things like you know being healthier and, and able to cope and save better for when there's a crisis and being more resilient. So, what you want to do is show those benefits, and you can do that through pilots of different cohorts of people. So you could do a pilot that was entirely around, entirely um, um, with um, young parents. And you could prove the benefits to young parents with a pilot like that. Um, I would like to do that sort of thing in London. One of the, what and the other thing you can do is a, a universal thing that is done at a, at a very sort of local level as well. And the, the pilot that took place in Finland was 2000 people and was in a particular area. Now you can do that as well. Um, the one I wanted to try in London, I called Creative Autonomy Allowance. And it was, um, that was the name that come from the Young Greens who we devised the policy with. Um, 
And essentially the, the enterprise allowance of the 1980s is the inspiration for this. And the enterprise allowance was essentially a top up to the benefits you were able to get if you were trying to start a business. Mm. And, and for some reason in the 80s, you didn't have to give much paperwork to prove you were starting a business. So lots of people use it to start bands or support like their own stand up comedy careers. It, it was amazing for creative people effectively, and also for, for people wanting to start small businesses. And I think that is the those are that sort of cohort of young people who are feeling a bit of despair at the moment. I wanted to put as mayor about 30 million pounds into a trial of a thousand people who you've sought, you, you, you used um, academic methods to find a, a way of selecting them to be quite representative of that group, but also quite properly selected so that you weren't using you have to apply because that would ruin the point, and then use that to prove it. So I think what we need to see is, is local areas pioneering this stuff to pr start proving the benefits to government, um, and then also campaigning really hard for government to put elements of this into the welfare system to so start to remove more of conditionality because it was shown to, to really have a crisis and it ought to be the permanent way we do things great i've got um just one one final question um sean which is about technology and um uh you know the, the implication of what we were discussing earlier is you just shift out to certain forms of activity you know you you you, you stop flying or you stop driving uh, as you know there's another uh, approach which is often promoted which is no we can we can find the technologies that allow us to carry on doing these things different fuels, different forms of uh, uh, different kinds of engines, different batteries and so on. We can electrify, et cetera, et cetera. How, how far, I mean, how far, what's the balance in your thinking between kind of technological change and technological improvements, you know, heat pumps rather than gas boilers, yeah. um, you know, different fuels for aeroplanes versus kind of, no, that just some activities are just impossible to, uh, to rid the carbon content from, and we've got to just do things differently. I think you've got, I mean, in all, in all cases, there's a bit of a mixture of behaviour change um, and, you know, changing the, I don't mean behaviour change as in like pestering people to do things differently, but enabling behaviour change. Um, you know, things mm. like building, walking and cycling infrastructure will reduce people driving as well. So you've got to, you've got, you know, being on a mission to, to do that as well and making sure that people know that they ought to be trying to share a lift with people that sort of that sort of behavior change you can you can do but also technology and that, and that applies within people's homes as well so um one of the one of the side effects of, of for example making people's boilers more efficient and use less fuel was people would put their thermostats up for example that's a, that's a side effect of that so you you can you can't just rely on technology and 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 not change mm. the space and the, the big thing for me being a big transport campaigner and understanding quite well how transport systems work is just replacing cars with electric cars is not going to be the answer. We need much more shared transport and much more effort put into reducing the need to travel as well. Um, yeah. Every single problem is not solved by one silver bullet and, and there is a little bit of a, a shiny silver bullet Hinge to a lot of the government's plans when they announced their 10 point plan yeah the new deal the other month and that was probably, probably about six months ago now um it was all shiny new things and some of them are really speculative and and to me that's not good enough you know there's there's system change there's reducing the, the stuff turnover the embodied carbon in our in the stuff that we use um of which in which there is loads like i said before about repair and reuse there's loads of good jobs in that there might not be loads of profits but there's loads of good jobs in that and those are the sorts of things that we should be thinking about more not just how we get yeah super green new things which is not going to solve the problem great well thanks thanks very much sean and um uh it's been great to hear you uh th this evening i i'm I i'm sitting in a room not far from elephant and castle i can tell you the shopping centre is now basically half demolished. Oh, um, they took away the elephant a few weeks ago, didn't they? The actual elephant. Yeah, the actual elephant has gone. Um, but um, uh, it's very interesting that uh, when you give people opportunities in, in London, because of its urban density, as you were saying, for engaging in planning, participatory planning, you get very, very different kinds of outcomes and different kinds of objectives. And um, you talking earlier about um, city airport, the London Borough of Newham, which faces, as you know, its offices face the airport. Um, it has created the first permanent citizens assembly um, in the country. Uh, I, had a, I was involved in this a little bit um, as by chair, chairing a democracy commission for them. And the first uh, randomly selected citizens for that permanent citizens assembly, one of the first um, 
issues that they chose to debate and make recommendations on was the 15 minute city. Um, so, you know, clearly expressing a desire to put livability, to put their local community, uh, their ability to access services and amenities uh, in their localities at the kind of top of their agenda. So um, I think, you know, what you were saying there about the importance of participation, what it means for them, the kinds of urban outcomes you get uh, mm -hmm. is really, really important. Yeah, I, so, I got the idea of the city airport off um, a citizens initiative in Newham. They, they, right, they yeah, the okay. report said that's what they'd like. And I'm like, right, then I'll do that. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so anyway, so thank you very much. There are loads of ideas to discuss and debate in that. It's a, it's a very big year, obviously, for climate policy because we've got COP26 coming up later in the year um, we, we're at Glasgow. We, and, we at IPR have been doing a lot of work uh, on these issues. And I just want to say to those watching us and listening to Sean this evening that um, we'll be doing a lot more debates and discussion about climate change, environmental transition, ecological transition uh, in the coming months ahead. So do please stay engaged with our work. And as I said at the beginning, if you want to listen to... Sean's lecture again or you'll recommend it to friends it'll be available shortly as a podcast and to watch again so uh, please do do that uh, but just again on this on this sort of warm summer night with the sun coming in and heating you up Sean thank you very much for um, <laughs> thank you very much for giving us your time this evening and for uh, for your talk and for answering those questions so comprehensively thank you very much indeed we really I, appreciate I, it I enjoyed it a bit you know not used to doing lectures so hopefully that was interesting <laughs> No, it was great. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks to you all for, for watching and uh, do come back and join us again at future occasions. Thanks very much.